try that now. Can you hear me now? I hear you perfectly. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. We got to get switched over here. Okay. Just... Oh, I see you. You look real good. Yeah, we got a Kino flow down here for you. That's great. Okay, we're going about to. We haven't switched the screen yet. I think. Well, I'm up there and you're up on mine. Okay. Let's see if this microphone's working. Thank you very much. Yeah, we stick around. So no, we gotta get going. Test. Right. Um, we got one last technical thing here. Can you still hear me, Bill? Yes, you sound great. All right, let's go ahead and switch. Ladies and gentlemen, the director of Sorcerer, William Friedkin. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, in Wichita, and um, hello, Leaf. I want to thank you for setting up the screening. And uh, you are the Sorcerer Fan of the Year for uh, this screening and for going so out on a limb to uh, make sure the people of Wichita get got to see it. And I'm really grateful to you and to all the people in the audience. Well, thank you so much for letting us show it and for doing the Q&A. I've been trying to explain to people how I, I asked if you'd just videotape an introduction, but that didn't really interest you, and you said, but I'll do a Q&A. And I was like, well, it's like asking somebody to borrow five dollars, and they say no, but I'll, I'll just give you 50. Yeah, you know, you <laughs> well, I'm, ha I'm happy to talk to people about the film. Um, I, I don't need to re do an introduction, because I think the film speaks for itself, and that's why I hesitate always to introduce it. I wanted to tell you that we have a, my, a few people who made treks just to be here for the screening. I, uh, I was prepared, I was getting ready to drive or fly out to the East Coast or the West Coast. When I heard that you had shown it at the new IMAX screen at the Chinese Theater, I was just going crazy. <laughs> I couldn't believe I missed it. And so I started budgeting to figure out what it cost to go out there. And I thought, well, maybe we can do it here. But uh, so I didn't have to go anywhere. But my brother, he drove three hours. It's not bad. Wow. A little theater trip. The one cat who loves this movie drove seven hours from Little Rock. Just to see this morning. Who's that? Where are you, Tim? Oh, you can see Tim back there. Hi, Tim. Hi, Tim. How do you feel? Are you tired? <laughs> no, uh, I drove yesterday, so I got a good night's sleep last night. Boy, well, you're the man for doing that. I just actually flew 12 hours from the Czech Republic and uh, just got back here last night. And I, that was like a 14-hour flight, so I can imagine what it must feel. Of course, you're a lot younger. You can do that. <laughs> well, it was, it was worth every hour. It was, looked great. Thanks very much, Jim. But I appreciate you being there. Yes. Stop drinking that. Uh, stop drinking that sugar, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Drink some water. <laughs> I did a quick poll uh, when I introduced the film earlier, and I say it uh, less than a quarter. Of, we had over 200 people in here uh, had seen the movie. Less than half had seen, but most, I mean, at least another quarter had never even heard of the film. And so tonight, mm -hmm. you, you got exposed. Over three quarters of the audience, it was a brand new experience. And for some well, people, well, that's great. You, you have to look at it this way. The film is 37 years old now. There are not a lot of films that opened last year, or five years ago, or 20 years ago, or whatever, that will ever play again anywhere. Uh, some of the, some of the most popular films of all time don't get played, and it's because of the new media and especially the social network that a film like Sorcerer has come back to play on first run screens um, like the one you have at the Old Town there, and uh, it's playing all over the world now. And it was made 37 years ago when we made this film and. When some of the great filmmakers 
um, who really invented this meeting, people like Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton, when they made their films back at the beginning of um, the, the feature film, they never thought their films would play again. They would play for a week somewhere, maybe two weeks, and they figured that was it. There were no other on which to play. It was play. For the last several weeks, I, I've been pretty much preaching the gospel of sorcerer. Uh, <laughs> when I was distributing posters around town, I was talking to anybody who was ready to talk about it, to the point where I literally felt like a Jehovah's Witness saying, excuse me, sir, do you have a few moments to speak about William Friedman's sorcerer? <laughs> and one of the things, uh, when I'm talking about the film, I keep on coming back to is, is uh, the process of making the movie. This is a prime example uh, of time in cinema when making the film itself was an adventure in itself. And now you have whole movies like Avatar where people aren't leaving a warehouse and, and nothing exists in the room. I mean, there's some amazing CGI happening, but there's just something to be said for actually seeing it where that, that bridge is real and the truck is real and the storm. And if I, how did you, I heard different stories as to how you created the wind in just the bridge sequence. How, how was that? Well, uh, there sometimes was a lot of wind. And when there wasn't, we had these enormous fans with virtually miles of cable running through the jungle to uh, liquefy them. So that we used my hands to sustain them. But a lot of what you see actually has those conditions. And sometimes be heavier, so, so it would be light, and sometimes the water would rise and based on the rain. One thing I, you know, I just heard recently for the first time ever is that you, one of the trucks actually fell off the bridge during filming. Is that right? Oh, the, each truck fell off about five or six times. <laughs> <laughs> I was in it at least twice that I remember, and probably a time that I don't remember. Uh, half, I, I, when the film was finished, I had malaria, and uh, half the crew got gangrene or a, a lot of serious after effects. And uh, yes, it was an adventure, as you point out, but it's not one I, I would go through again. Uh, I've often said I had a kind of a sleepwalker's sense of security when I made the film. Uh, but now that I've gotten a, a, a little older and, and, and now that I've seen what we did, uh, it's, a, it's surprising to me that I ever got through this film without someone getting seriously hurt. I've been praying, when, since you had to go and dig out the negative for this, when, when the trucks went off the bridge, was the camera rolling? Does that footage still exist somewhere? Yes, it does. <laughs> I have been waiting and waiting waiting for some of the, have you ever seen Hearts of Darkness, the movie about Apocalypse Now? Yeah, we, that was a documentary that was made while the film was being made. We didn't have that done. That, that was rare to do that. Francis Coppola's wife um, shot that documentary when they were making Apocalypse Now. Yeah, but still, I mean, this was Universal and Paramount Finance. Did, did they never send out just a crew, like, for a few days to do a behind-the-scenes, an EPK type thing? Uh, no, because there really wasn't any outlet for it then. They, they, you know, um, home video didn't exist. You didn't have DVDs or Blu-rays or uh, all the cable networks that you have now and streaming. You didn't have an outlet for behind-the-scenes documentaries then. Francis Coppola's wife um, undertook to make this documentary, uh, Ellie uh, is her name, because, you know, she was just getting bored hanging out in the Philippines all that time. <laughs> Yeah, I know, I know that was a, a different situation, but I still, at least outtakes, you know, and, and I know Roy Scheider's not with us anymore.
but w Waylon Green, the screenwriter, is still with us, isn't he? Oh, yeah. Uh, Wally Green, we call him. He was, um, he, he was what they called the showrunner on a show called uh, Law and Order for 10 years, which means he rewrote every script of Law and Order for 10 years. And I still see him. He came to the screening uh, at the Chinese Theater when we ran it there. Yeah. We, uh, Wally also wrote uh, Wild Bunch, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The first time I ever saw Sorcerer, I finally... Now, you know, one thing I wanted to back up, I know that a lot of people concede that Star Wars, obviously, uh, was part of the problem as to why I didn't find an audience. And Star Wars, I'm not going to take away from it. It was a huge movie for me. You know, I, I, it made me want to make movies. I was only eight years old when that came out, but I remember the commercial for Sorcerer and watching the shot of the truck on the bridge, and I was mesmerized. I love Star Wars, but I still wanted to see Sorcerer, and it took me about yeah, six. I, I think it's um, overblown, you know, the effect of, of Star Wars. There is, there is a movie god, Leaf, and the movie god decides what films are going to work and what aren't. And, uh, largely, uh, that, that is the province of the audience. The people that are sitting behind you back there, they decide what they want to see. And it's not for any other reason than the decisions they make in their own minds and in their own homes, what they want to see and what they don't want to see. And, you know, I've had films that have worked and worked all over the world, and I've had others that didn't. And I have no complaints, especially now, uh, when my a film I made 37 years ago is playing all over again because of people like you and and all the people that are uh, in the theater tonight. Well, I, I loved it. It's uh, it's absolutely one of my favorite movies. Let me let somebody else ask a question. Yeah, sure. Thank you all. I'm going to let Tim ask a question, the guy who grew up in Little Rock. Right. I see you, Tim. Nice to see you. I got rid of the sugar. Oh, cool. Yeah, I want you to live a few days longer. <laughs> well, I was wondering, I read that when you first built the bridge at one location, uh, that the, the river dried up for the first time in generations. Mm -hmm. And so the bridge had to be completely disassembled and moved to another location? That's correct. We first, we first built the bridge in the Dominican Republic over a rushing river that was 12 feet high off the ground. And we were told that the river had not diminished by so much as a foot the memory of man runneth not to the contrary. <laughs> and gradually, after we built the bridge, the water level started to drop and drop and drop until it was less than one foot <laughs> off the ground. It was drying up. And so we had to disassemble the bridge, which took months to build. And we found another location in the jungles of Tuxtepec, Mexico, which is you know, uh, at the beginning of the Mexican Amazon. So we had to entirely uh, tear it down, uh, ship it, and rebuild it in another country. And and you got some pushback from the the people in that in that village or that town in Mexico? No, I think what you're referring to is when I arrived in the town, which was near uh, where the river was. The town was called, is called Tuktepec. And uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, as I was arriving, uh, one of our, uh, one of the um, people from the village who greeted me uh, showed me uh, where we could set up tents and stay in the jungle, which is what we did. We all had tents in the jungle, which is where we stayed while we were making the film. I saw, when I first arrived, all these people leaving the village. They were all going out of town and they had suitcases and knapsacks and duffel bags and stuff. And I said, they were leaving by the hundreds in the small village. And I said uh, to 
to the guy who uh, was welcoming you. I said, where are all these people going? Is there some festival or something in town? He said, they're all leaving because the director of The Exorcist is in town. <laughs> That's true. But enough of them stayed back to help us and work on the film. That's amazing. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Tim. Get some sleep before you drive back. I'll stay awake with the Tangerine Dream soundtrack. All right. <laughs> Hello, sir. Hi. Hi. Well, I saw the film in the theater in 77 when it came out. And over the years, over the years, you know, I've told people when you talk about your favorite films, it's, it always comes up and nobody's ever heard of it. And uh, so it's great to see it again. I, at the time, I was just riveted. I thought it was one of the best, you know, most intensely suspenseful films I'd ever seen. But I've always been curious, why did you change the name of the film? Why didn't you go with the original The Wages of Fear? What, what's because the, because the film is not a remake of The Wages of Fear. It has different characters, different situations, different dialogue, everything except the central idea. And it's not a remake. It's like if somebody, I'm sure there are probably thousands of productions of the play Hamlet going on right now all over the world. And there have been millions of productions of Hamlet and other great plays. They're not called remakes of Hamlet. They're called new productions. And that's how I view Sorcerer. It's a new production of, of a classic story. It is not a remake. You, you know, you have people who do various musicals at all times. I don't know what plays are going on in Wichita right now, but I'm sure you've had productions of all the great music shows there. And they're not the original productions, they're new productions. And, and you know, people get used to calling films a, a remake. The only true remake that I recall was the, the film that was made again a cycle a few years ago. They did a remake cycle, which means they copied the original film frame for frame. And that's not what we did by far. So um, uh, I would never have felt comfortable calling this film Wages of Fear. That film is a great film. It stands on its own. I've, I've always liked the title Sorcerer. Always just, even as a kid, just seemed to make some type of metaphysical sense. But why did you call it Sorcerer since you changed the title? Uh, I, I, I don't know, Leaf. Why did your parents call you Leaf? <laughs> that's, that's why I'm a history buff. Did you like my uh, Right. Uh, you know, but there is no real why. I mean, uh, there's several reasons. I saw uh, when I bit, when I scouted locations in South America, I saw all these uh, heavy duty trucks that were painted like the ones in the film and they all had names. And one of them had the French name Sorcier, which means sorcerer. And there was another truck there called Lazaro, which is, you know, uh, was the Spanish word for Lazarus. And I like those names. And then also, uh, a new uh, recording came out around that time by Miles Davis, who I then and now continue to listen to. And he came out with an album called Sorcerer. So I, probably that's what influenced me more than anything. A kind of a tribute to the Miles Davis album. Well, how do you think the name affected the way people received the film? Because I, I you know, when I tell people the name, they, they have no idea. It's like they have no clue as to what it's about. Why should they have a clue what it's about? <laughs> you know, uh, you know I, it's something for people to think about themselves, you know? And um, I, I don't, in any facet of a film that I make, I don't like to tell people what to think, you know? I, look. You can go around this country with, where you say, you talk to people, they've never heard of this film. They've never heard of Sorcerer. You know, 
Most of the people that get polled don't know the name of the vice president of the United States. Or the names of any of the people on the Supreme Court, you know? And, and I'll bet you there are a lot of people that don't know who the, the governor of Kansas is. You know, and uh, this is true all over the country. So if people don't know or remember Sorcerer, I'm not surprised or shocked or disappointed. I'm only happy that you're still talking about it and watching it. And the name, you know, names of films are always arbitrary. Citizen Kane, which is the greatest film I've ever seen, its original title, the, ty the title that's tight on the cover of the script, is American. The original title of Citizen Kane was American. And just before they uh, released the films, they decided to call it Citizen Kane, named after the main character, Charles Foster Kane. So why? I mean, I, I have no idea, but um, would American have been just as good a title? Probably, but we know it as Citizen Kane, and Sorcerer by any other name would still be the same film. Thank you. We got another question for you. Hello. Hello. Hi there. Hi. Not to make you keep talking about the name, but when I invited my dad to come to the showing, he said he had gone to see the movie in theater, but he didn't remember it. Uh, all he remembered was that he back then they didn't have any way to really find out what a movie was about. There wasn't social media, so you didn't you know hear about a movie a whole bunch before you went to see it. And he was a big I fan. Think that's fan. I think he was. Yeah, he was a, a big fantasy fan and a Dungeons and Dragons buff, so he went to this movie with a little bit of a mixed uh, idea of what it was going to be about. I understand. And I don't know how he doesn't remember what it was about, though, after I saw it tonight. <laughs> well, maybe he, he, he might need an examination. I'm, not... <laughs> I'm going to make him watch it again, because I'm not going to forget this movie, so... Thank you very much. Look, uh, I've seen a lot of films in my lifetime, and I don't remember them all. I mean, that's nothing new. And people might not have remembered the film had it not been re-released. And you know, it's now out on Blu-ray, and I just finished making a brand new DVD, which will be out August 5th. So when it gets released and it's available to people in their own homes, It'll be harder to forget. My other question was, uh, did you pay the stunt drivers as much as the drivers were paid in the film? Because <laughs> it seemed really impressive what they had to do. <laughs> well, uh, stunt drivers and stunt people all make a lot of money, and they should. It's a very dangerous job sometimes. Less so today when you use computer effects, when you don't do these things live. Definitely, thank you. Thank you, thanks for coming tonight. Hello, sir. Greetings, sir, my name is Ryan. I just Hi, wanna Ryan. say that, that To Live and Die in LA is legitimately my favorite film of all time. And thank uh, you. I, I have a thematic question, like, I've noticed that in both To Live and Die in L.A. and in French Connection to an extent, and in this film, they both they deal with – parts of them deal with vehicles going the wrong way. Is there something about that that, that you find attractive? <laughs> it's an interesting question. I, I find it um, rather common and extraordinary that the course of people's lives is controlled by which way you do go. It's like the famous Robert Frost poem about uh, coming to a junction in the road and the direction you take and the one that you don't take. And the one that you take can change your life completely. And uh, um, when I finished The Exorcist, I realized 
that The Exorcist was a film about the mystery of faith. And I then wanted to make a film about the mystery of fate. And that's what Sorcerer is. It has to do with the mystery of fate, the road not taken, and the road taken. There's a moment in the film, I'm, I'm sure you remember, Ryan, where the truck comes to a fork in the jungle, and they decide to go one way, and the other truck comes up behind them, and the guy jumps out and says, no, you're going the wrong way. We go left, not right. And they go left and they come to this rickety old bridge. No one knows what the other, where the other way would have led them. So, you know, that's a very key moment in the film. And it's very much about why I made the film, the road not taken. Okay. And I have one more question. Yeah. Uh, do you did you find it or do you find it easier or more rewarding to work with more established actors or uh, actors just starting out? Like, was working with Roy Scheider before Jaws easier than working with Roy Scheider after Jaws? No, it wasn't. Easy. <laughs> you know, and it's not supposed to be easy. Uh, once an actor gets a reputation. As Roy did, they change, people change. And you constantly have to try to not change in the sense that you don't become someone else, someone that you're not. I've had to face that problem throughout my career. I obviously, you know, I grew up in a one room apartment in Chicago and we had nothing. We, But I didn't know we were poor because everyone else in the apartment building lived the same way we did. So, um, and then I became a film director and I achieved some success. And it's hard not to start thinking well of yourself. And if you think too well of yourself, you can self-destruct. So it's been a constant struggle for me to remember that I'm just another bloke from Chicago, you know, <laughs> from a one room apartment. And I try never to forget my origins. And a lot of people who become successful actors do forget that. And they lose contact with the people and the things that made them who and what they were to begin with. So I, I hope that answers your question, Ryan. It does, sir, and thank you very much. Thank you, and thanks for coming. We have uh, time for a few more questions, if that's okay. Sure. Are you good? Oh, yeah. Hello. Hello. Welcome to Wichita. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I've been, through, I've been in Wichita, and I love it. I, I, I just love it. <laughs> well, welcome back. What are you guys laughing at? <laughs> There's evidently some scoffers out there. I'd just like to ask you, how did you come to work with Tangerine Dream on the sport? Okay, what's your name? Krista. Krista. Uh, when I was on a publicity tour for The Exorcist in uh, 1974, I went all over the world and I went to Germany. And uh, I was told when I got to uh, Munich in Germany uh, that uh, um, there was this new group that was giving a concert uh, in the Black Forest outside of Munich in Germany in an abandoned church. And they, they were a new music group that very few people had heard of then. This was in 1974. And I went out there at midnight to hear this group in an abandoned church. They played without lights. And the only lights were the lights from their electronic instruments. And I went there and uh, uh, at midnight, and the, they gave a concert in complete darkness for almost four hours. And there were just three musicians. And they played these long uh, tracks where they would play the, the same piece for an hour and then another piece for an hour 
And it went on and on like that, and it was hypnotic. It was magic. And I've never used drugs at all. <laughs> but it was a hallucinatory experience to hear this band then under those circumstances. And uh, uh, I met the leader of the group then, and I said to him, look, I don't know what my next film's going to be, but when I do, I'm going to send you the script because I want you guys to do the score for my next film. In other words, I felt that my films were on the same page with their music. Well, thank you so much. And thank you, Krista. And by the way, yeah. they wrote the score without seeing the film. Oh. They just, they, they just, um, I read the script and I told them what the film was about. And uh, off of that, they wrote a score. They wrote maybe three hours of music. And I got it after I finished shooting and I chose from those three hours uh, what, I, what it, I used, what's in the film. And recently uh, I was in, um, uh, recently I was in um, Copenhagen in Denmark and the Tangerine Dream, the new Tangerine Dream, played the score live at the Tivoli Gardens in Copenhagen, and they played, uh, they played for three hours. They played stuff that I didn't use, and it was recorded, and they planned to release that concert recording. Well, the score, the score synced up magnificently, so it must have been fate. Work. It was, Krista. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. I'm just curious. We got another question coming, but is there any chance you're going to work with the, the new? I don't have any plans to, but I, I I went to that concert as I told as I mentioned, and I saw them again. It's a new band, except for the leader Edgar Frazee. He's still playing, and he's got six pieces now, including himself, and they're just great. They, they, they rocked a, an audience of young people there that night. Hello. 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 I'm Zach. Uh, what is it? Zach? Zach. Hi, Zach. Yes. Well, I'd like to say I did really enjoy the film. It was the first time I'd uh, heard of it and seen it. Uh, I paid for the entire seat, yet I did only need the edge. <laughs> and I was actually wondering if, uh, since we were having some audio troubles when Leaf made his comment and his question earlier, if perhaps you could um, recount some notable stories or, um, you know, things that happened in the adventure of making this film. You know, uh, I wrote a book on the connection, and I, I there are stories in there that and it was, I was a struggle to remember those things. I never kept notes. I, I never uh, uh, kept a diary. And when I wrote my book, it took me three years. And I had to sit down and remember things. And different memories would come to me every day. And sometimes I'd remember a lot of stuff about something and then forget it and go to something else. Offhand, you know, I don't know what would be of interest to the audience. I, I really don't. There were all sorts of things that happened. I mean, you led me to the answer about why did, or Tim led me to the answer about what, where were all those people going? Why were they leaving the village? It was because I was arriving there. <laughs> the, oh, well, the other thing that happened in the Israeli sequence when we shot that um, explosion, it was a terrorist attack in Jerusalem. A block away, there was an actual terrorist attack. That While we were filming the one um, uh, directly across the street from the mayor of Jerusalem's office. And, and we actually ran down to the, where the real uh, terrorist attack occurred and filmed the aftermath of that. What? I mean, uh, I wish that we now had peace in Israel. 
But, you know, when we were there and filming that terrorist attack, um, they were going on, but they were more or less rare. And then they became less rare. And now the situation, well, you all know what it is. It, it, it's just a tragedy. And I remember uh, experiencing that. And, um, it, you know, no one had a sense of how far the two sides would, would grow. And as I look at that now, I know that we couldn't go to Jerusalem and film a sequence like that today. But there were many uh, such things that occurred. Uh, I, my memory needs to be provoked to, to put them together in a coherent story. Though. <laughs> well, thank you. Hello. My name is Drew, and I've noticed that you have a pretty established style of directing. But I was wondering which directors influenced you the most in your. Uh... I I can tell you the directors who influence me, but my work looks nothing like theirs. Um, and I, I I don't mean that to compliment compliment myself, but their their films, the ones who influence me, are so great that I could never approach them in terms of quality. I'm talking about people like Orson Welles and Federico Fellini and um, Michelangelo Antonioni and uh, Ilya Kazan. There are many others whose works inspired me. My work is nothing like theirs. Um, theirs stands alone. But those were the great filmmakers whose work inspired me to want to make films. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Drew. <laughs> What's your name, dear? Haley. Haley, hi. Um, I'm, I'm kind of young, I'm 19, and this is the first movie of yours I've ever seen. I was really impressed. Um, I'm glad to see thank you. Thank you. Um, you should go to see The Exorcist, then. <laughs> I play a lot. <laughs> But don't don't try it at home. After you <laughs> okay. Um, my question is uh, kind of more of, uh, not as focused on this movie as it is just uh, a question about yourself. Uh, there's so many ways to tell a story. There's uh, books, writing, um, paintings can tell a story, music. What made you choose uh, cinema as a way to tell stories? It's a great question. It was a medium that least um, um, intimidated me. I mean, I was able to see some of the great paintings growing up in Chicago at the Art Institute. And I realized I could never be a painter. I could never paint a portrait like Rembrandt or uh, a landscape like uh, uh, Vermeer, view of Delft, for example. Um, I listen to a lot of music, classical, jazz, and rock and roll, and I've always felt I could never do that. I could never uh, write music like The Doors, for example, uh, who I knew when they were playing. I could never make music that would be that good. I could never write music like Beethoven. But no film that I saw really intimidated me. They just inspired me. Citizen Kane is a film that I still feel I could never approach as a filmmaker. But yet, it's I've always felt that I could try to make a film as good as Citizen Kane. The truth is I never have, but it doesn't stop me from trying. The other medium, and like writing, you know, I've read the uh, Marcel Proust's Remembrance of Things Past, which is now called um, In Memory of Lost Time, the new translation. I read F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby um, and other novels that really wiped me out. I knew I could never write like that. 
but I never had seen a film that so intimidated me that I felt I could never make a movie. Yeah. Because, by the way, uh, you know, not all the novels or plays or music is great, but the ones I had seen were so great. The paintings, for example, at the Art Institute, that they just put me away. But uh, I have never had the same experience. For fi I've seen films that I know are great, but they've never prevented me from trying to make my own and maybe reach them someday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, I'm Logan, uh, Lee's brother, and uh, I'm one of the uh, people he's proselytized. proselytized. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, I've seen the Sorcerer poster on his wall for years as a child, but I never saw the movie. And I would hear stories about different sequences, and when the uh, Save Sorcerer for Blu-ray came up last year, I definitely like, oh yeah, I've never seen it, I'd love to see it on Blu-ray, so I signed up to help with that, and then it was like, hey, we're gonna show it at the theater. And I was like, well mate, I wasn't gonna be able to come to Wichita, so I was like, okay, I'll watch Sorcerer, and I got a copy, and I saw it, and I, it was great. Thank and then you. my brother's like, hey, well, we need to do a promo trailer uh, for the movie, and I, and I think he was asking offhanded, but I just started going through the Blu-ray and picking out all the original clips from the original movie trailer to try to, because we couldn't find an HD version of the original trailer, so we reconstructed it, and so... I got very intimate with Sorcerer, going frame by frame, counting out frames from the different shots and watching stuff forward and reverse to find that exact hand movement in order to cut it back to the original. There are some shots in the original trailer that are not in the movie, and so that leads to my question. Was there anything in the original script or in this latest transfer that you had to leave out? You just either couldn't shoot no. or something didn't make it? No. Uh, I didn't make the trailers. Uh, there, there are people who make the trailers for films. I didn't make the trailer. And the cut that you've seen tonight is my cut. That's it. That is the film. The film never contained one more frame or one less frame. That's it. Um, and I, as I've looked at it many times, there's very little that I would change today. Very little. You guys out there might have some ideas about some things that should be cut or changed, but I don't. That's the film. Well, thank you very much. It was thank it was, you, and thanks for doing your own trailer, and thanks for coming out. We got one more. Okay. Okay. Hi, Bill. Hello. Um, I, I'm Leaf's wife, Samantha. So it's very Hi, nice to meet you. Um, I want you to know that I did listen to The Exorcist on a loop for over 48 hours. The movie played, I think while Leaf was busy working on special effects for something. So I, I'm very familiar with every nuance. I had to actually wake up and tell them, please, please turn it off. I can take no more of it. <laughs> I'm seeing it on a loop now. But um, I really appreciate you doing this. This means a lot to, uh, to my husband. And you've been a big part of our lives, whether you know it or not. Uh, the Exorcist is framed on our wall with your signature on it. Uh, your movies are in case in our house tangerine dream is something we listen to go to bed to along with halloween and a variety of other themes so man, to that, sleep. So <laughs> man, i'm gonna send the psychiatrist to your house in the morning <laughs> <laughs> listen i appreciate it you're very kind and i thank you for that thank you and this is his birthday today so this is a wonderful gift to him and i just really thank you for all the God bless you. you. So, all right. Thank you all. And I sent uh, Leaf a note some time ago saying happy birthday. Yay! He doesn't always tell me everything. I have to learn from phone conversations. So. No, I sent him a personal uh, tweet wishing him a happy birthday. 
Thank you. So, thank well, you thank so you, Samantha, for enduring all that you've had to do. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. So. I, I understand. And thank you, Leaf. And thank you all, ladies and gentlemen, for coming to the movie tonight. I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, Lee. I know you got another show. Thank you so much. And uh, bro, I, I'm also a, a huge fan of your recent movies, Killer Joe and Bug. Bug blew me away. And as always, I'm looking forward to your, for, uh, to your next movie. Keep, all right, keep making them, sir. Thank you very much. And thank you all, ladies and gentlemen. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank Good night. You. Thank you. God bless you all. God bless you, sir. Okay, honey. <laughs> it's my wife, guys. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> In 1971, William Friedkin directed The French Connection. It received five Academy Awards, including Best Picture of the Year. In 1974, he directed The Exorcist. It made history. Since then, Friedkin has spent over two years in five countries on three continents, creating his latest film, an unusual adventure into the realm of suspense. future, trapped in a life that was also a death. Four men take an incredible chance, face an impossible challenge, and risk the only thing they have left to lose. Roy Scheider, in a new film by William Friedkin. Sorcerer, rated PG, parental guidance suggested. <laughs>